And with that, I say welcome and thank you so much to everyone that has joined us today. It is the November edition of the Talking Trade and Investment Global with Femi Boyede. We are so excited to bring this edition at this time. And the topic is as timely as you can imagine. Nigeria's economy. How exactly can we explore foreign reserves, improve our exchange rates, and where does the solution lie? We think it is non-oil export, but we have our guest speakers here with us today. Mr. Ikechuku Kalu he is an economist and a business strategist. I'll read more about his profile in a bit. And we also have Madam Afishe Tsubraimo. We've been longing to have her on the webinar for a while now. So we are so excited that she is with us today. She is the former Honorable Commissioner for Industry, Trade, and cooperatives in Edo State. Uh, to this webinar, I will be your anchor. My name is Shei Fumi Adibote, and I am standing in on behalf of our very able and capable Lady K, um, Madam Kemi Amushan, who is, she is unable to attend today because of some health reasons, but we are very sure that she will follow us uh, from our online platforms. And this is also a, this is also to mention that if you would like to share the link with your contacts, feel free to do so as we start uh, the webinar. I'll give the word to Mr. Olufemi Boyede, the CEO of and the convener of the uh, Tatric, that is Talking Trade and Investment Global, to open the floor and then we will get into the conversation for today. Welcome to everyone. Mr. Femi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Shei, and um, I appreciate you guys all. Um, the wonderful, I call you, and I mean it, the world's best team. Uh, thanks for making this uh, happen. I welcome everybody, particularly I want to welcome um, our guests today and hopefully uh, our new West partners, because um, the way I've seen your profiles, uh, we are not likely to want to let you go even after today. I hope I'm, I'm not uh, jumping the gun ahead of the technical team, but I think that we have a duo here who uh, have all the solutions, I hope. And uh, I, just like I uh, discussed with uh, Afi sometime this morning, um, we'll just keep doing what we're doing and uh, Trust God that uh, this um, uh, things we do, we get to um, uh, to uh, hit the appropriate years where they actually translate into um, economics and social and even welfare progress for the uh, Nigerian uh, masses and Nigeria as a whole, both the public and private sectors. Uh, well, we're talking trade and investment uh, global, uh, incorporated in Canada anyway as a not-for-profit. We actually started this to uh, with the intention of uh, filling the knowledge and in, uh, information gap uh, that uh, hinder smooth uh, intertrade among countries and. Um, uh, positive and profitable performance by um, SMEs, whether uh, they be in the developed countries or in the developing world. And um, of course, we try as much as possible to uh, touch on topical issues. And that's why, just like um, our moderator and anchor today, Shei has said, uh, in Nigeria as of today, nothing can be more topical than the spiraling, uh, downward spiral of the Naira, the uh, uncertainty about the solutions. And um, I know John Isemede, um, former DG Nasima, who is on this call, I know he understands um, exactly uh, where I'm going when I say that uh, the solutions appear to be sporadic, uh, more sporadic than spontaneous anyway, and therefore, not sustainable. We have said um, on other platforms that uh, it doesn't matter how 
many billions of dollars that uh, the Nigerian government is able to either borrow or beg or access and uh, pump into the uh, forex uh, space. All these are just going to be temporary solutions. Uh, they will probably um, relieve you of the immediate pains and aches. They will never, never uh, touch the root cause of the problem. And that's exactly what we think in talking trade and investment global, that Nigeria, like the Asian tigers, can actually be transformed into an, a non-oil export-driven economy. And uh, therefore, uh, it is my pleasure, my joy, and excitement to actually have two uh, experts. Um, I know I've, I mean, I've followed the AFI since her the years as a commissioner. I've also followed her track record as an entrepreneur who had uh, more like brick and mortar, picked uh, something from nothing and is uh, now uh, actually um, pushing Nigerian products, particularly those from Edo State, in the world market. And I believe that what, uh, what the experiences that she has garnered will actually all go well for everyone who is participating in this uh, webinar today. And therefore, on that note, I want to again welcome everybody and trust that we are going to have a great time to, together. I believe that um, we will also uh, enable uh, collective engagement a lot of uh, interaction just as we uh, hand you over back to Shay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, sir. And for those who do not know, uh, Mr. Olufemi Boide is, uh, I, I introduced him briefly as a co um, convener and the brain behind this, but he's also someone who is driven by passion. And over the last three decades, He's been one of those at the forefront of pushing for non-oil exports in Nigeria. He served as an advisor to three different ministers at different levels. He has also been at the forefront of promoting Nigeria and Nigerian businesses across the world. This among many other things. But the focus today uh, will be on our guest speakers. And like I said, we are more than excited to have with us Mr. Ikechuku Kalu and Madam Afi Braimo. I also look through the chat and I see some really incredible profiles. Mr. John Isimede, I see Dr. Molara Konji, one of our foremost and always uh, consistent um, comrades, I should say. I also see Madam Uju Asan Baba, uh, former NIPC boss. So it's really a good mix of people today that we have in the space. And I'm very excited to learn I'll pass the mic to you, our guest speaker, Mr. Ikechuku Kalu. But just before I do that, uh, just for people to have a feel of who our speaker is, Mr. Kalu is a driven professional with over 10 years experience assisting organizations in sub-Saharan Africa to transform data into actionable insights. He's skilled at analyzing industry and market data to identify growth opportunities, organizing findings into compelling presentations like the one you'll see today, and providing recommendations that are aligned with corporate organization. He's currently a, life, a consumer lifestyle management team member at Wema Bank PLC, and he's been previously uh, engaged with PowerX Limited, RGS Global, and Polaris Technologies Limited. He's an analytical thinker, so come with all your questions. And uh, Mr. Kalu, we are so excited. Can you please take the floor as you walk us through today's session? as we explore Nigeria's uh, economy, foreign exchange, ex um, foreign reserve, exchange rates, and non-oil exports. The floor is yours, Mr. Kalu. Thank you very much, Shei. Uh, Shei, for me, I appreciate the opportunity. And I'd like to thank the convener of um, this group and all the people of, that have joined to spend their time um, within this um, period that have been allotted to me. So I'll delve right into the topic 
um, straight away. Uh, Mr. Femi had already touched uh, partly uh, on the root cause as regards um, forest uh, issues and uh, the issues we're having with in terms of generating export. So I'll just dive right into it so that we can see the presentation. Thank you very much. Just to double check, you'll share from your end, right? Yes. Um, right. Confirm, confirm if you can see my screen. Not yet. Okay, I see you start sharing now. Great. We see your screen. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I'll be speaking of foreign exchange, uh, foreign reserve exchange rates and non-oil export. Um, a very topical conversation. Over the past few months, um, it's been the most important conversation uh, for uh, everyone in the country, knowing how pivotal and how important it is to what are domestic living and in the businesses that we do. Um, Forex is somehow tied to everything that we do, being an import economy. However, the conversation, being invited to an export um, platform shows that yes, there are a group of people who understand the problem and are trying to um, solve the problem from a root cause analysis framework. So here we go. Um, the state of play, what exactly is happening with the economy? Today we have um, our, we have our forest reserves at thirty three point five billion dollars, as stated by the CBN. Um, NAFEX rate is eighty four four to one dollar. Um, if you look at parallel rates, of course, um, it's around one thousand one hundred and forty. Our crude oil is one point three million barrels per day, far below our capacity. We can see our inflation rate is 27.73%. Our non oil export is at 4.8 billion for 2002. And our budget deficit as of last year was 7 trillion. These figures point to a story. They tell us that there is a crisis brewing. Added for $33.3 billion gives us barely seven months cover. However, as we go along the line, we see that this is just a gross reserve um, that tells just a part of the story. And policymakers are at a crossroad in trying to determine how to shape our current macroeconomic indices. Of course, the FX rate moving from um, 400 to 800, of course, it jumps to 1,000 at some point. It's a crisis level jump, which is way more than 200%. So as we go along the line, we see exactly our forest reserves. We see the trend. Um, I did a five-year trend to say from 2014 to 2023, we see the lows, we see the peak, and we can see that at the level that we are now, we are $33 billion um, from a high of $60 billion in 2008. That impacts our ability to meet our obligations. And then that also impacts how countries respond to both letters of credit, our banking financial um, sector responds to letter of credit that emanates from Nigeria, especially for those who are into importation in export. So we see that um, this, this state of play shows a dire situation. Um, our foreign reserves are usually, for those who are not well of us, foreign reserves are assets that are held on reserved by monetary authority. In our case, our CBN. 
These reserves are usually used to back liabilities and influence monetary policy. And they include all of the foreign banknotes, uh, deposits, uh, treasury bills, and foreign government security. Um, we are reported to have the $3 billion gross reserves with a significant number in Kumba. I put this footnote um, just to show something that happened sometime in August, a report that came out in August that showed that from the $33 billion that is assumed that we have in our gross reserves, um, FX forward at $6.8 billion. Security lending, I already have $5.5 billion. And currency swaps, we are allegedly to have entered into currency swaps worth $21 billion. And so JP Morgan projects that our net foreign reserves is around $3.7 billion. What this state of play tells us is that a giant of Africa at $3.7 billion, we are vulnerable. And so foreign currency speculators um, begin to attack the currency and begin to um, speculate. And that's why we see the movement we have in our currency. This movement, we are going to see wide swings um, as a result of this state of play. However, the government has not um, folded its hands. Policymakers are trying to respond. And what has been the response so far? Um, the response has been that they are going to free, we are moving towards a more flexible or market rate determined exchange rate system rather than the fixed exchange rate system that existed prior to now. And in moving to that market rate system, it means that um, willing buyer, willing seller. So people bring their um, dollars into the market and put the price that is it's they want for their dollars. However, we have seen that within the NAFES platform, um, price stayed at 750 for so long, while in the power market, we saw wide swings. However, um, within the last few weeks, um, we've seen further movements uh, in that space to ensure that um, currency is around We've seen that space to be currencies around 834 Naira, as, as at this morning was 844. Now on the NAFES rate. What we now notice, we notice now that there's a spring, a lot of speculation going on. A lot of people are holding back. Um, a lot of people are front loading demand just to ensure that they can get a lot of dollars that they need to trade within the period that they need it, and they don't have to resort to go back to the market. So we find that speculative motives are mixing with um, genuine demand that is not that is yet being unmet. However, over the last few weeks also, um, there have been news that came into the market as to um, banks, CBN clearing FS backlogs. The FS backlogs are part of the $6 billion that you see here. Um, they're clearing that in the market. And then there was some appreciation, um, which, which saw Naira appreciate a bit. And then the movement continued this week because all has not been, up, uh, has not been cleared. The whole backlog um, is still not being cleared. I think about 90% for foreign banks, why local banks, are yet to be cleared. So we still have a persisting situation where the foreign reserves are in Kumbad, and then Nigeria is looking for funds everywhere. So we move to, um, this is a chart that shows our FS supply and demand needs. Currently, what are we seeing in terms of uh, demand? For FS supply, we are supposed to get oil. Of course, we get um, FS from oil sale proceeds, LNG, um, cash calls, um, other commodities, of course, which is export of agricultural commodities, diaspora remittances, and inflow. While for, de for demand, we see tradable goods, 
uh, payment for invisibles, which people who are education, foreign education, medical tourism, um, dividend repatriation, and swap arrangements. The state of play shows that our oil sales have declined significantly. We lose an average of 400,000 barrels a day um, to oil theft, and the government is continually fighting um, oil theft to ensure that that is recovered. However, um, as of today, we still have production at 1.3 million barrels from a high of 2 million barrels um, before COVID. And that has impacted on our forex, um, on our forex ability to um, receive forex. Same thing for LNG. Um, the managing director was quoted in the media to say they are operating at 58% uh, percent capacity, meaning that if we're expecting forex from LNG, um, that forex level is dropping. Same thing for our cash calls. NMPC has been paying backlog of areas over the past um, few years, I think close to $5 billion. And that has made them not to be able to, uh, they are deducting directly from the money that was supposed to be paid into foreign uh, federation accounts. And that has denied revenue to the government. For other commodity sales, we've seen an uptick in commodity sales that has come in the form of um, non-oil exports. We've seen an uptick in that numbers, but that is not significant enough um, to take Nigeria out of the doldrum. Last year, we did around $4 billion, which was reflected in the other chart. For diaspora remittances and invest investment flows, diaspora remittances um, dropped significantly um, last two years, um, just after COVID. And this year, we have seen that the square remittances have stopped flowing through the um, usual channels. We have seen a proliferation of peer-to-peer -peer, um, transfers. And so you have all manner of transfer scheme um, when you want to transfer um, dollars to Nigeria. And because it's not going through the official channels, um, CBN is unable to capture that. And then that is happening at the parallel markets. Um, which is affecting um, supply of dollars to the market. This used to come directly into um, the banking system and used to account for supply in that system. So we see that on the supply side, um, just commodity sales are showing an uptick, but all the other elements um, are downward sloping. They are going down. For tradable goods, what do we trade? Um, we bring in you need demand for dollars for um, wheat, um, corn, sugar, all of the things that we bring into the country. Um, payment for invisibles and repatriation for dividend, then swap arrangements. In all of this, um, those of the people who are in tradable goods uh, feel from A, sometimes they get just a fraction of what they need for um, bringing in there. And so they have to source the rest from parallel market, which also impacts the demand as well in that space. And we see growth. Payment for invisible as well. Um, we see the same pattern continues where they have to, um, the market cannot meet, the, the I and E market cannot meet that requirement for them. And so they have to go on the outside. So we'll proceed to the next slide. Um, for exchange rate, I spoke about this. Um, so I'm just going to sp speak about it more extensively. Um, I said that we we're moving to a more, CBN has announced a more flexible exchange rate regime. Why is this in place? They do not have the firepower with, at the current rate of um, foreign reserves. I mentioned that foreign reserves was supposed to be used to support monetary policy and then to defend our currency. But at the level that we are in terms of policy, the CBN has said it would, it's not in a position to defend the Naira. So we are moving to a more flexible exchange rate. 
and so as to enable um, the Naira to find its level. So they have adopted that as a policy. And today we can see that the Naira has moved from 400 um, in the trend. We can see that it has moved sharply um, into the 800 uh, region. And we are seeing 839 as of this. We see that also that the government has made a key pronouncement that it's going to unify the rates. And it has made it a key objective that it will um, unify the rates. However, at different, at different markets, we have seen that um, the divergence have continued. The parallel rate is at 1,140, and the official NAFES rate is at 839. That is about, we are seeing a divergence of around over 30%. That tells us that that policy um, is are still not taking root, and so Naira is still swinging widely. Um, the settlement of FS forwards, like I mentioned earlier, the last few weeks, last few weeks, um, saw some appreciation for Naira within this zone, and then we are back as the market has been able to soak all of all that up. Like we said, some of these things are temporary. However, um, temporary, however much the temporary relief that we have, um, we must also begin to look at a much more sustainable um, intervention by the monetary authorities. However, that would require a combination of um, the fiscal space. The fiscal authorities complement what um, the monetary authorities are doing currently. For non-oil exports, I'm particularly very um, focused on this uh, because this is supposed to be an export um, group. And then so we look at the figures. I put this graph here, which is called from um, FTC Research. Um, I just did a come for crude oil. We see that these are major exports. However, um, gas also complements that. Then we now see cashew nuts, cocoa, uh, system seeds, and soya, soya beans. This shows um, our major crops, which is supposed to be our non oil exports, alongside our major exports. There is no gain saying that our major export is crude oil and bringing much more revenue. However, we see opportunities in this place. There are clear opportunities for export from this zone. So the conversation should be, how do we get this graph to begin to grow as this, to begin to grow as this? How do we begin to get this? So I did a, a, a further study, sorry. I did a further check on April, May, CBN, report. This was a more recent for this year. It shows um, top five market share of non-oil oil exports. And in the Rama, petrochemical had 11% of the share of non-oil exports within those period. In the Rama is a fertilizer, they export fertilizer mostly from their plants in Portacot. And um, this is contributing to a bigger share of non-oil export. Outspine comes second um, in, in production in terms of non-oil exports. And we see that Outspan deals with, we, we notice that Outspan Limited deals with the metals. It also deals with aluminum. And we go to Segiola Resources. Um, if you are paying attention to say, um, if you pay attention to events in the mining space, um, you know regular resources. Um, they are also into export of um, gold, export into mining, they are into mining and export of uh, precious metals. So Segiola is doing 4.2% of that within that period. Uh, we see metal recycling, they recycle aluminum, um, we we'll see them come in this space. Then we see Starlink Global. 
Sterling Global, Esports Cashew, and Coco. And so these are the top within 2023 for April and May, all from CBN reports. Now, these are what I call, for the non-oil exports, I call them a defense mechanism because it gives you a much more um, stable income if we are able to develop it. Oil has a lot of swing because it is autonomously controlled. You have um, OPEC who's in charge of it. And then there's, there are some things that are beyond our power. We get OPEC quota. We are limited in terms of that space. And so our best bet is to look at how we can improve our export from within Nigeria so that we don't have wide swings. And we have a base in terms of our, our, our export, export income which is more or less what we call diversification of export revenue. I'm jumping in here to say, I know your slides are quite rich. I'm very particular about slide 11 that says what must be done so we can allow for a lot of interactions. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so we see the, I, I build a trend here. So we see a trend for 2019 for non-oil export figures. Um, 2020, we see a high of almost $8 billion. We see a movement and a slowing down. Of course, COVID happened around here. And then we are trying to climb our way up, um, climb our way up. Right now, we are at this point. Um, we are looking at, of course, and the NAPC is trying to see how we can scale up, scale up in terms of, getting it um, to a high of at least $25 billion um, in 2025. Is that doable? Of course, nothing is impossible. It depends on the commitment of the stakeholders in here and in government. It depends also what the monetary policy authorities decide to do and what the fiscal authorities, as well as agents playing in the um, field say. So my next slide, like I mentioned, um, $2 billion in 2021, um, $4.8 billion in 2022, and a, a projection of 2025 to have $25 billion. It looks impossible um, from where we are but there is nothing that is impossible if we commit our hearts to it. If we are 28, in three years, can we muster the ability to deliver $25 billion in terms of non oil exports? The answer lies in what everyone who's responsible, all the stakeholders in the export industry, likes to do. And that is... That will lead me into my next slide to say what should be done, what are the complications currently. We know that currently we have logistics constraints. What do I mean by logistics constraints? Um, for exports, um, you have to aggregate first. Um, within, you have to aggregate products um, at hinterland. And so there are people who do aggregation um, that, in terms of trying to get those products out from those hinterland, um, roads can be a challenge. Um, getting it to port cities becomes a challenge because of the bad roads, um, because of the inadequate connections, um, transport connections as well. Um, also, the delays at the port, we all, we all know the challenge we have with port administration. And um, so that is, those are part of logistics constraints. We have a fragmented value chain, um, which are part of um, things that I've mentioned before. Um, a value chain that there's no proper link between uh, processors and then handshake between processors and then the farmers. And then there's no proper handshake in terms of proper refinement to, um, to the standard that is required from um, those who are going to use final end user. So we find that there, between the value chain, there's always a mismatch or misalignment 
which needs to be um, well cooked and well taken care of if um, there has to be progress with our exports. Um, infrastructure, um, we cannot overemphasize the, the impact of infrastructure. I'm um, talking about train, talking about good roads. Um, currently, inland towards um, Edo State, um, somewhere around Kobe State, some roads, even coming out from Benue, which is a major food zone, you see that um, the roads are a problem, especially after rainy season like this. You find that there are lack of infrastructure to be able to stay. We need to have cold vans. We need to have um, very critical infrastructure, storage um, equipment. Um, even if you have storage equipment, there's no power to be able to run that. Even if you have power, there's diesel. In terms of cost of diesel and cost of operations, you have all of all that mix. Um, that could be a problem. Um, for small holders and small producers, people who are just coming in. And then we have the knowledge gap in terms of knowing technical know-how, to understand how to package things, to understand what exactly is the requirement, country requirements for um, nations where we desire to export to, and as such, um, quality um, begin to do, we have a lot of returned goods returned um, goods back to the country. And this sort of tend to be discouraging for people who are encouraged involved in export business. So these are the complications um, that we see in terms of export. So I moved to inquisitive cluster. Um, there's always been the talk around having a group that helps you to engage government. Um, because if you are, you are properly clustered, it becomes easier to have a um, conversation with government. It becomes easier to assess intervention. But we found that export groups sometimes that do not present a common front. And then it becomes a problem in terms of who the government needs to engage with or how the advocacy needs to come across. Um, and I, it's also important that to mention that um, I, I, I recognize the work of Tashrit and the advocacy that they play. Um, these are more of such um, advocacy. We see um, recognition by both the lawmakers, um, governments at every level that needs to uh, participate in this and sort of solve challenges that um, export groups are having, but peculiar challenges. It could be in terms of the host, it could be in terms of roads, and it could be in terms of road, uh, it could be in terms of law making, law, legal issues, it could be in terms of fees and all of all that. So there are so many things that uh, could be in addition when you do not cluster yourself properly uh, to be able to um, engage government. Mm. Yes, so for sake of time, I up. wonder if you could, yes, for sake of time, I wonder if you could bring this to a close for now and we get into the interactive uh, session in a bit. So how would you like to like call it in, a wrap in like a minute or two? Okay, so I, I'll just touch on one more slide. So before I, um, before I call it, so I call it what must be done. Uh, so what must be done to ensure that um, all of the challenges that we have now, for crude oil production, I mentioned that for our FX, we have a current challenge. Um, if we can get FX, we can get crude oil production to 2 million barrels per day. This provides us with some stability because as the economy is now, it's like a patient that needs urgent blood transfusion. And that's why you see the president going all around to just get at least a, maybe a minimum infusion of at least between five to $10 billion just to stabilize the market rate. Because without stabilizing, there is no, it's not easy for us to plan. So by next day, you need to be able to plan um, for the future to say how much this effort is going to be in the next few months. But if you can't plan and you have these wide swings, it's going to affect, and that's why improved crude oil production by stopping the debt is important. Uh, monetary policy realignment, we said that the monetary policy realignment to tame inflation, um, ensure that cash is sucked in, inflation is tamed, um, 
interest rate is increased so that um, the inflation is thin. And then there's a realignment, there's transparency in the... Um, I see... I don't know if I'm so you want to make an... You can ask well, a question. Well, I think it will get into a hard debate right now. So I would let you close with this export-led growth. And then we take Madam Afi and we get into that interactive session, okay? Okay. So the export-led growth. Um, so this is where export comes in, which is um, uh, the non-oil export. We can see that we have potentials in agri-space. Uh, beyond the agri-space, I know that we have potentials with uh, recycling. I know that we have potentials with the um, mineral, which is a metal space. Um, we need to anchor our growth to all of all those and ensuring that there are targets in terms of export. Every encumbrance in terms of export, export corridors must be built so that people can export within maximum days. An institutional framework within the port administration to allow exports to flow very quickly is very important right now. So I think, I think I'm just... Let, let, let's 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 take a pause on that right now. Thank you so much. You raised yeah. a lot of very important issues. The biggest question for me is: in three years, how can we jump from four point eight billion where we are right now to twenty five billion US dollars in terms of non oil exports? I see that a lot of people have also been scared. I see Mr. Mohammed AK raising his hand. I knew Mr. Femi raised his hand when you talked about improving crude oil production. And I just imagine the kind of back and forth and a slight bit of provocative but well-intended debate that we'll be having in a few minutes. But right now, I want to welcome someone. Like you said, we need more people in the, we need more agents playing on the field. And the next person I'm bringing is someone who has not just been, you know, in the role of policymaker like you highlighted in the beginning, Kalu, but also is now an agent playing in the field. I, I, I got a news that I found really incredible. Maybe she would share with us that she now has access to one of the biggest marketers across uh, Europe and also some parts of the America. Our next guest is uh, Madam Afishetsu Brahimo. Like I mentioned, she's the former Honorable Commissioner in Edo State. Right now, we love to, to, to we, we call her a Nigerian professional because over 25, 25 years now, she's gathered lots of experiences from hospitality to technology to finance and of course, the agribusiness, which uh, you've described a lot as the core, the meat of non-oil export um, trajectory, the way we want it to go. Uh, without any further ado, Madam Afi, we have been waiting. We cannot wait any longer to hear some of your insights, some of your comments, maybe some direct response to uh, Mr. Carlos' presentation when it comes to Nigeria's economy, our foreign reserve, exchange rates, and non-oil exports. The floor is yours, Madam Afi Shetu. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever everybody is in. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Mr. Femi for um, putting this together. Um, you have been consistent, I think, on a monthly basis with these sessions. And I, some of them I joined, some of them I couldn't join, but I'm so honored to uh, be a part of the session today. Um, thank you, Mr. Ikechukukalu, for um, that uh, presentation. It, it, it opened my eyes to a lot of other areas, but nothing that um, surprises us. I think the biggest surprise for me is how we are going to go from a $4.8 billion export economy, export, yeah, to 25 billion in three years. Um, it, a lot of, I think that's gonna be a miracle. Um, but I think, like you said, anything is possible. I think it's all about the political will. Um, I think it has a lot to do with ease of doing business. Um, how we even do what we do when we do it. Um, and it starts from the government. They have a huge, huge role to play. But anyway, um, I think you literally said a lot about the problems. And in fact, most of them really tie in with uh, a lot of the problems that I've seen. Sorry, I don't have a presentation deck. I don't think we need it. I think it's just having this conversation because if we don't have this conversation and we're just going through you know, um, decks and decks and decks, I feel like we'll just feel like we're teaching constantly. Um, so for me, let me just rehash some of the things um, that I made a note of. Um, consistent, with some of the problems that I've seen, um, consistent government policies, which are very, very unfavorable. 
2023 yep, has been one hell of a year for not just exporters, but Nigerians as a whole, starting from cashless to you know, uh, removing subsidies and, and just the incessant you know, increase in prices of our products. Just this alone, I don't even know how we can successfully export. You know, a lot of people are doing it. Um, and I believe strongly that that 4.8 billion, like you said, there's metals involved. But even when we say agro, what are we exporting? I see us exporting a lot to Asia. And guys, let me tell you something. The Asians are not sleeping. They are taking these products. They're sending them to uh, China and India, wherever. They're not just processing them and sending back to us. They are actually selling them at a cheaper rate from Asia to Europe and the US. If you look on Alibaba any day of the week, any day, any day, any time, take a look at a lot of what those products are. And those products are making it into the US. And I can tell you from experience that when I'm looking for stuff, of course, I'm, I'm you know, going into you know, the communities that I belong to to see who has them. But those same products, I go on Alibaba, I'm seeing them for half the prices that we in our communities are actually selling. Because we, we, we just see the Chinese as, you know, the perfect people we're selling, you know, uh, for example, we're selling on hibiscus petals to Chinese. There's a Chinese price, there's a US price. What is the difference between these two? Why are we, why do we have a Chinese price? In fact, what are the Chinese doing in our farms, in our backyards? What are they doing there? Our government needs to get them out because wherever you see these people, you see money. If I see any white skin in my farm I, or in my village, I know there's money there. So I need to be going there before they get there. And it starts from the grassroots. It starts from the farm. And this is why I started a farm to table program when I was commissioner. And I realized that our people die from lack of knowledge. So we started from the grassroots, helping them understand what it is they have. I just started an empowerment program in my village for um, the youth on beekeeping. And then those even with cashew trees, you know why? Because um, a cashew farmer told me, and he has 50 hectares, and he said to me, I said, how do you price your cashew? Oh, there's one man that comes and tells us how much it is. Why should a cashew farmer be dependent on someone dictating the price of his cashew? And he has something that everybody needs. Let's look at who's even exporting these cashews. Starling. Who is, who is behind Starling? I think Nigerians. I go to Walmart and I see cashew and nuts and all that. And at the back, it says product of where you'll see maybe Ghana, you see Burkina, you see Nigeria. Who is shipping this, these products to these countries these days? Or oh, I see Jollof seasoning. I see it on, uh, what's the name of that brand in the US that everybody sees? Where's the Nigerian that sold that Jollof seasoning to them? Why isn't it with Nigerian names on these products? We have what a lot of people want, but unfortunately, between our government policies and the lack of education on exactly what it takes to export the bottlenecks at the, at, you know, at the ports, which Mr. Kala has talked about. And then of course, when we don't even understand all of this and we have these high expectations that if we, anything we sell out there, someone's gonna buy. You know, so for me, um, it, it, I had to start from the grassroots, build this farm to table program. My office was like a market square because everybody came in there. We assessed the products. I help people package. I help them rebrand. I help them develop the concept around what do you even think you have in this in this in this bag, right? And then I prepare the SME for export. I don't prepare anybody for Nigeria. We seem to be able to figure it out here. We need to compete at the global marketplace because that's where it is, like Mr. Kalu said, right? So if I'm working with you as a coach to rebrand your product, I'm not preparing your packaging for a local market or GMO. You know, you, first of all, you don't even put things like GMO on your packaging. You do you're dead on arrival. You know why? Because the world glow over, including the Chinese that develop GMO, do not, you see in the rest of it says no GMO. But in a lot of our products today, we put them in there and we export, we're expecting to export those products. We can't and we won't be successful. So instead of me focusing now on a lot of, sorry, I get passionate about this, but instead of me focusing on a lot of what the problems are, because we all understand what the problems are, how are we going to even get past this, right? For me, starting with the farm to table program, which by the way, I'm no longer commissioner, but this doesn't end. It, it just got started, right? It's taking a look and making sure that people are prepared for the global market, helping them understand things as detailed as the nutritional label. Yes, the government has their part, but you know what? With or without the government, there's a lot of people exporting. So what is it that they know that we don't know? 
right? So you so I help educate the SME. Understanding the nutritional um, um, labels are very, very important. You have to align with the legal requirements of the country that you're looking to export in before we even go that far. What value does your product have? that will you know, make someone outside of Nigeria buy that product. All of us, someone is doing share butter, everybody and their mother wants to sell share butter. Whether they have the market or not, if everybody's doing it, there must be something in there for me. If it's cashew, everybody wants to sell cashew. How about if one person do the share, maybe they process it, manufacture it, another one does the oil, another one does the, you know, the marketing, Another one puts all of it together so that collectively as a community, we collaborate to put it in the market. Not everybody doing raw share butter because you know you have to, what is that value that you're bringing to somebody? You have to be selling something that someone needs. And so you do your research. We must do our research. If you don't do your research, you don't even bother because it's hard enough even selling in Nigeria. Then we have the AFCTA where you have to deal with all of these border issues. Not to talk about the US and the UK. As I speak today, I am actually going through the process of certifying my products organic. You can't put the word organic if you're on your product if you're not certified. The best way someone will find out that you can go to the website USDA and then you put in uh, sack fruits. Is it certified or not? Because there is a process. I see some people that say organic. Are you certified? Have you gone to the process? And it does cost money. So basics like this is all about education and helping people understand that there are legal requirements before you actually want to export to a certain country. Um, you've got to train people, you've got to educate them. I, I probably trained uh, probably about 150 SMEs or exporters on FDA so that they understand that before you export any products that is fit for human consumption and animals, by the way, then you must have FDA. And then I represent, my company represents um, you know, a lot of people's agents because you need that to be able to export into the US. So what else are we thinking? I, you know, set up a program, you know, where I arrange buyers for sellers. Now, before we even go into that process, your, your product must not must be uh, processed. You must go through the value chain. And the government can play a big role in this industrialization policy all across 36 states, right? Because commodities is mostly commodity, commodity, commodity. But we're leaving so much money on the table. If we just look at cash alone, you don't need to throw away one inch, one ounce, one fruit of the cashew because there is something that you can do with that what cashew does. Why are we stopping at raw cashew? Um, one to, uh, as commissioner, my first few days, a farmer walked into my office and he, gave, he brought an envelope. He had a five-year agreement with an Indian company for him to provide raw cashews. And they were so detailed, the agreement specified raw cashews only do not send us process because they would take that they would do like there are 10 value chain opportunities in cashew including using cashew one part of the cashew to create i mean to create coal to provide power in your factory and i found it so sad that you know and the, the farmer was being given this contract and then how much one thousand two hundred dollars for a container or a ton of cashew, when just two ounces of uh, cashew roasted in a pack is $2.99, $2.99. So how would you now give a farmer $1,280 for an entire container to export raw cashew? They understand it, but our farmers don't understand it. And between when I started as commissioner and by the end of, um, even within six months of it, not only did we tear up that contract, Today, that farmer is exporting directly himself as opposed to exporting uh, through a farmer and not just raw, but also processed, okay? So another thing that I've done um, is showcasing our products to, uh, to the US. Every time I go back, I look at the shelves, especially with primary edible products, and then I take them back with me because we are ready to compete on the global marketplace. The shelves are emptying in the US, really. And the Chinese are, you know, I mean, with Biden doing everything he can to keep the Chinese out, it's late. However, it's time for Africa, for Nigerians. We are the last frontier to come and compete. I recently got a, um, a signed a vendor agreement to put our Made in Nigeria and Africa products in Walmart, in Key Foods, in Bravo, and some other local stores. And I intend to do that because my dream is that because we are in the position to compete, we should 
just follow the rules, the laws. And like you have other co countries, Korea has a, a, a shelf, India has a shelf, Jamaica has a shelf. Even, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Nigeria, Africa, we must have a shelf. And we, we will continue to do that. So we need to keep looking at things like this to help move this needle. I'm having conversations with uh, the commissioner from Miami to see how we can get an Africa hub. Guys, our music is mainstream. Our fashion is mainstream. Our movies have been mainstream even since before COVID. In fact, I don't know, one in probably three, four households in America were watching our movies on YouTube while they were sitting at home. So what is our, what, what are our products still doing in African stores? That is what I'm trying to change so that our products can compete in the global place on the same shelf with all these other products. Because you know what? We have great products. Most of our products, of course, majority of them are truly organic, but you must be certified. And so that's why I did everything I could to sign this agreement. We showcase at trade shows, Fidelity Bank. That's why even though the, the government has a role to play, our government has issues. We all know that. So collectively, what can we do bit by bit? Fidelity had a trade show in the UK, very successful, I believe a year ago, November. They brought that same trade show to Houston um, when recently um, in October, which I attended, 200 exhibitors were in Houston to exhibit Made in Nigeria products. It was great, it was successful. However, where are the buyers? I think if we're gonna do things like that, let's make sure that we have buyers because these people are gonna pay um, transportation, they're gonna ship their goods and they're gonna do accommodation and they're all in dollars. And then they don't have buyers for their goods. And by the end of the show, everybody's scrambling. How do I sell? How do I sell? I don't wanna take it back. These things are not, I mean, the, the, you've got, we've got to work together to see how we can um, collaborate to find buyers. Then we're talking about pop-ups. We have pop-ups in malls these days so that as you're listening to David Doe and everybody, you know, 10 playing their music, you're going to be gravitating towards my pop-up stand to wonder what I'm selling. When I'm there sampling pepper soup or jollof rice seasoning or whatever, you will smell it and you want to know what it is. That for me is where we need to be. This is where we need to go. And that's what we started. And then I think another thing is one of the big concerns that a lot of people have is, okay, if I start trading, I have a Nigerian account and there's this ridiculous policy on remittances from from the from you know your sales why would i remit it to my local uh, bank here when if i want to get it out i wonder how much i'm going to pay i know a lot of that has changed but because we know how bad our system is right we need to look at how can we trade with our currency without the fear of the u.s dollar and that's where ancestral comes in um i partnered, you know, I've just joined a group where, and it's called Ancestral, A-N-C-E-S-T-R-A-L, check them out, where you can now trade as buyers and sellers on this platform and off the platform. And then you will get the exact exchange of the goods that you, that you sold in your account directly without the fear of Forex. We need to stop, we need to reduce our dependence on the foreign exchange. We need to do that. And with a tool like that, where it also helps put your, you know, um, get you connected to buyers and also being able to market your products as well because you're all on this platform. There is a lot, a lot more peace of mind that even for those on the other side will trust the process if they know that, you know what, I'm on this platform. If I'm going to buy from this person, I trust the source to be able to transact on this platform without worry of someone making my, my, my I mean, uh, for me, for my money being stolen. So we have to look at what are these tools that can help us reduce our dependence on forex, reduce our dependence on imports. We import too much. That's also a policy, um, a policy situation. Fidelity is ahead of the game. They're already planning for the next one. And I'm involved in the planning to see how we can get buyers connected to these sellers. So when they spend all this money in coming to the US to do a trade show, then they also have the opportunity for buyers to actually buy their products. And you know that way they start earning the foreign exchange that they need. And what I say to, to my SMEs these days is guys, if you even make $1, $1 is 1,000 Naira or you know, 800, you get more for that same product than you would if you had sold that product in Nigeria. What do I mean by that? So my products, you know, sat fruit, say, you know, um, my, my pack of mangoes out the door from my factory, maybe, 500 naira okay my products are on amazon they're also in in the walmart store and they're also on walmart marketplace 
I sell one pack of my mango for $4.99. Do the maths. So if you can get a dollar for that product, then focus on your pricing. I know they say, oh, it costs so much to um, uh, in shipping, whether by air or by sea. And as such, I have to price high. It doesn't work like that. They don't care how you ship the product. If your product, if your price is not competitive, you're, you're not even getting out of the gates. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. All right. So it's priced accordingly. Recently, I arranged a buyer-seller um, um, meeting in Edo State with my amazing export cluster um, under the NEPC. She came to Benin. We had a great meeting. And she was so impressed with the products, the packaging, the quality. And we parted ways with her taking an order back to the US. She's the largest African store in Miami. I said, I will bring my Edo products into my store. Six weeks after, here comes our problem. The price of each of those products was three times what she gets from the resellers in Lagos. Of course, we've gone back to the drawing board. We're not going to give up yet, but guess what? That whole thing was dead on arrival because she says, I have to pay bills. I know how much I pay my staff. And so this is real, guys. Let's leave all that you know, nice looking thing. We export 4.8 billion. What are we exporting? The average SME is not within that 4.8 billion, that much I can tell you. All right, then working with local authorities to educate them. I'm working in Miami, I'm educating them. I brought a 41 man delegation to Edo State. I didn't, I didn't just bring them for fun, from, from America. 30 of them or so, 37 of them were um, uh, business owners, wanted to come to Africa, see what it's all about. And then four of them were commissioners. Today, one of them is the head of commissioners in Miami Dade. And I use that opportunity to keep educating them about who we are, what our products are. And they said, we're open for business at your state. We're open for business Nigeria. So you know what I've done? Capitalize on that relationship. And we're working on finding land or a building in Miami so that we can have, have an African hub like the one that is being built right now that um, Oram of Afriak Simban talked about recently um, in New York, where we can you know, demonstrate what we have, who we are through our music, shows, events, trade shows, and of course have fine dining and even supermarkets right all within there. Jamaicans have their road, Haitians have their road. Why can't Africans have ours? You know, so it's very, very important for us, you know, um, to keep looking at some of these things. And then uh, one of the things I have here, um, let me say Africa Hub, but yeah, engage with Export Nexon Bank. Yes, um, I met with the uh, head of the uh, Export uh, Nexon Bank recently at the Fidelity Fair. And I said, look, you know, this is what we're looking to do. And we won't be successful if the um, agro processors cannot get their products here because they don't have the funding. And they said, let's start having this conversation. So there should be a marriage between government and you know, um, you know, um, 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 MSMEs and DGs and all that to be able to collaborate to make this work. But I tell you, people are doing it, whether they're going through Ghana, whether they're going through Burkina, they're doing it. I've done it. I've been exporting my products for the last seven years. Um, you know, and I'm not going to stop. The, the policies have not stopped me. But if we come together, build communities and be able to understand what it takes, understand the legal ramifications, make sure that your product has value to the person and make sure you find a buyer before you start thinking of exporting. Don't think, oh, they'll take my products there and then someone will find a market. It ain't going to work. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I want to say thank you very much. And let's get into discussion. Exactly. Let's get into the discussion. It's time to have this conversation. I cannot thank you enough, uh, Madam Afishet Subraimo. Thank you so much, Mr. Ikechukukalu. What an exciting conversation it is. I see four hands are up. If they were literally up, those hands will be pinning them by now. And getting back to the topic for today, Nigeria economy, we've been looking at three themes, foreign reserve, exchange rates, and non-oil exports. Mr. Ikechuku Kalu had dwelt on the first two, and with your perspective, um, uh, we we have a robust understanding of how this non export works. Uh, I know a lot of tables have been shaken, and I'm very curious to now see in what direction the conversation will flow over the next 15, 20 minutes. I'll start with Mr. Femi Boyede uh, to make his intervention. After that, I will move on to uh, Dr. Omolora, Omolara Akonji, and then we'll come to Boston Sholani, if that sounds like a good plan. But before Mr. Femi Boyede comes up, 
We'll take this very quick break, please. This webinar is brought to you by Golfing Trade and Investment Global Patrick. We are live on Facebook at Export Digest. Kindly follow our Facebook page. Also, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Twitter at Export Digest TV. Mr. please. Thank you very much, uh, Tommy, and um, a million thanks again to our two eggheads, um, E.K. and uh, Afi. Um, you've been wonderful. <clears throat> I'm trying to look for another word, but okay, that wonderful. Oh, no, no, you've been tenderful. I <laughs> applaud you and thank you for bringing in your perspectives. Okay, um, we have the uh, foundation. And I just want to bring a few teasers, um, probably again to contribute to uh, steering our conversation. The question um, Ike asked, or the target that he projected was for Nigeria to raise $25 billion uh, or to move the export performance to $25 billion in the next three years. And I did a rough uh, sum while I was listening to you. Uh, this comes to probably um, eight point something billion uh, dollars per annum, or uh, let's even say, let's round it up to $10 billion per annum. If Nigeria sold 1,000 metric tons of cocoa butter per annum, those exporters will earn $5 billion, just cocoa butter. 1,000 metric tons. I know of a company called Rosemary Limited. I hope they won't cut my neck for um, uh, revealing uh, their investment plan that's currently building uh, the biggest uh, cashew processing plant in Côte d'Ivoire. The investment was originally planned for Nigeria, but because of um, unstable or some assaulting government policies that were not predictable, those guys moved the plant to Côte d'Ivoire. Um, Mr. Ikechuku's uh, list of top five exporters had LMA pre uh, Indorama petrochemicals and uh, two or three metals. That means that within them, what we had, I think uh, three years ago, then I was a special advisor to the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment. We actually had a, an interactive forum, a dinner for top 100 Nigerian exporters uh, somewhere at the Oriental uh, Hotel in Lagos. And um, I think that not up to five of these were in the I was, mines, I and was there. <laughs> and mines and metals. So, like, um, I'm trying to bring all of this. Okay, John, um, um, I'm trying to see that Nigerian exporters, including you, Afi, are presently playing in the global market in spite or in defiance of governments, the absence, total absence of government support for the industry. But this is a sector that can actually replace oil. And it is not a futuristic. I'm talking about in the immediate term. How to do this are the things that I would appreciate that uh, our comments uh, going forward come on. And I'll give you an illustration that I always give because it's so simple, even though it sounds so cheap. I'm sure Bosucho Lani can... Uh, attest to this. Um, she wasn't there, but she, uh, some of her members were. In uh, August 2022, I persuaded Smidan and Nigeria Export Promotion Council to support a Made in Nigeria solo exhibition in Banjul, the Gambia. When the concept note got to the uh, Gambian authorities, they jumped on board and uh, insisted it had to be a Nigeria Gambia thing. That was the origin. By the time it was a 10 day event, 
by B4 of the Nigeria Gambia solo, I mean, uh, trade exhibition, 30 Nigerian SMEs that went for that exhibition had sold in cash on the spot sales close to 200,000 US dollars. Now imagine uh, for people like uh, Ike who are very versatile in this and uh, with uh, banking experience and everything. Let's imagine, and let me quickly tie that to the efforts that AFI is making in North America. At, as at my last rough guesstimate, <clears throat> Walmart has about 3,500 outlets in uh, uh, the Ontario region of Canada, 3,500. If we sold, if Nigeria sold a 20-foot container load of banana chips exactly. to each of these outlets, your $25 billion is coming in less than a year. Right. So my answer to all of these things that we're talking about, there has to be a definitive approach. Now we talk about government, government, government. Yes, it's got to be government. Why? Because Nigerian products are not in the Canadian market officially because there has been an absence or a weak interaction between the Nigerian authorities. And now I'm talking about NAVDAQ and SON, one for the food and ingestibles, the other for manufactured products. That's the reason why if you need to export Nigerian yam, you need to put it in a box that is marked uh, uh, fresh yam produced in Ghana because the Ghanaian authorities have taken the steps to engage with CFIA in Canada and therefore if you go to CFIA portal today you'll see um, uh, admissible uh, imports yam comes under Ghana it doesn't come under uh, Nigeria and I could go on and on. So where is the engagement? It's not there. Nobody has taken the proactive step to ensure. Uh, Afi talked about uh, legal steps to understand and to activate a relationship with the target countries. These are things that we need to do if Nigerian, uh, 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 if non-oil export must generate on a sustainable basis. Back to the women who went to Gambia, um, 200,000 uh, US dollars in four days. None of those guys was going to come to any bank in Nigeria to apply for BTA or for school fees for their children for that year because already they had it in here in their hands. So can we do that approach that enables us to say, okay, we want to work with Hafi Brimer to actually place three Nigerian products on all the, the shelves of all Walmarts in North America and build the capacity, the export readiness. And this means across the entire value chain from production to financing, to logistics, to infrastructure, to all those challenges that Ikechuku uh, are listed. This is an export driven approach that I'm advocating. More importantly and more immediately, the only support that has existed for Nigerian exports and Nigerian exporters over the last 12, 14 years has been the Export Expansion Grant. Nigerian exporters have not received the grant since 2017. There are some that are even still being owed since 2007. Grants have been processed, have been audited, have been re-audited, have been passed through uh, 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 the camera passing through the eye of the needle. It's sitting on the president's table for transmitter to the National Assembly so they can get this. So I can go on and on. My recommendation, at least to demonstrate, I mean, to, to, to put their mouth where their dream is is government needs to call, call exporters together and find out 
I mean, and negotiate, judge or discuss what would you need us as government to do for you to be able to generate the foreign exchange that will show up the value of the Nigerian Naira, that will rebuild our foreign reserves from the paltry 33 billion that we're talking about, to be, that will re 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 restore confidence in the diaspora to come back to the official channels of remitting whatever they have, rather than what Ike has rightly told us. Because when the official channel is not attractive, the opposite. I read, I mean, I had an English teacher in primary school, words and opposite, official, non-official. Okay. So we will end up in non-official. Thank you. I, I, Sorry, I, I jumped in there. Time. Yeah, I jump in there. When I introduced uh, Mr. Femi Boyde earlier, amongst many other things, I was very particular about how he's passion driven and you can see that from the way he speaks mm -hmm. and if we give him the floor he can keep on going but i will welcome dr uh, omolara Akonji very quickly and then uh boston Sholarin will follow uh doctor welcome good to see thank you thank you again. very much and i want to thank uh, mr kalu and uh, madam afi for their presentation and intervention i want to say that um um we are we are we are, we are supposed to look at the two ends of the of the market, the import and the export. And in the analysis of Mr. Kalu, he mentioned the uh, issue of um, our um, FX um, forward trade, the FX forward trade as it were, sorry. The FX forward trade, it, 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 it was, um, reported at uh, 6.84 billion. I will be glad if we can disaggregate that number because when you are looking at the export, export side, you know there are rules and regulations for the um, export uh, revenue, as it were. Not all will come into the country, but this forward trade that we have, we have made, as it were, the forward, forward uh, FX uh, reserve. Sorry, I think uh, we will need to know what, uh, how, which aspect of this uh, six point uh, eight four billion it's uh, owned by the private sector and how much is owned by the public sector? Because when you when you export, you want to try to be in charge of your revenue, and that was what uh, Madam Afi was talking about. That you know to repatriate sometimes it's not uh, it's not too encouraging because of all the rules. But we need to break down this number of uh, FX uh, forward sales because there's a there's a, a kind of mis mismatch between this figure and the exports that we are trying to drive. That's my point. I hope the two sides can be can be able to help me to resolve this my my my, my issue because it's an issue for me. If we know how the side of the public sector that is own that is that owns part of the reserve, the uh, uh, forward uh, reserve that we have sold out, and the uh, the government side of it that we have sold out, I will be very delighted. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Molara Kondi. Former director at the CBN and uh, currently on the board of the International Chambers of Commerce. We really do appreciate your presence every now and then. And I hope that uh, either Madam Afi or Mr. Ikechiku Kalu will be able to respond to that. But we can take it, uh, if, if it's okay with you to respond to two comments at a time, I would welcome Boston Sholarin to also make a very short intervention and either of you can take the floor. Uh, Madam Boston Sholarin, please. Oh, yes. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon uh, here, members that are present here. I want to thank uh, Tatridge for giving me this opportunity to speak. I want to thank Mr. Kalu, thank uh, Madam Afishetu. Now, please permit me to be a bit angry and raw. <laughs> uh, sure. Is Nigeria a problem a cause? Madam, take because it easy. <laughs> because it's like we try to go forward. And then you look, they dash your hole. And 
I don't get. Oh, no. huh. Madam Afishetu, maybe this is where I should conclude, but let me start with it. Please create that shelf and that shop and take Nigerian micro exporters there. Now, for my point, Mr. Kadu, I had a bit of what you have I had what you have said, but I don't even want to comment. Because if the government that has banned place 43 items <clears throat> on a banned list. And then we come back, we remove those bands. And then we are, we are complaining every day that the dollar is not there. And so it has to keep going up. And people can barely eat. People can barely buy drugs. Please, permit me. I am not uh, where I can put on my video. So that's why you won't see me. Just <laughs> listen to my voice. Okay. And then we are there. Shouldn't government put that same energy to see how commodities because bulk of what we collect is in commodities we keep saying we are trading we're trading and we yeah. dash out our resources to people yeah. who make money from it is it difficult for our government to look for even machines of uh, 10 million will process something at least semi-process this cash soybeans and co instead of them and they put that same emphasis that they have put on this 43 band list to say okay nobody should export raw commodities is that difficult? Because if we now can buy one dollar for two thousand for one thousand two hundred, because me I sold one one thousand two hundred, <laughs> so I was smiling to the bank. But the truth is, is that is it difficult for us to take that route so that we can make more money instead of going to beg? <laughs> instead of us to go and be begging countries to come and help us resolve our FX issues when the solutions are here and we have said it. Is it difficult to see an agency of government that is working? And we cannot allow that government, even if we must play politics, for that, for that agency to do one more year so that you can task that agency. I'm talking of NEPC. You can tax that agency that in one year, this is what I need. And let the man go and look for how to give you, get, get you those things you need so that you can make more dollars. Is it difficult? for us to help our people, because the minimum anybody will take from anyone about certification is HACI. NEPC has been trying their best to do that. And so people can now export their processed goods out of Nigeria. I was lucky to have be, uh, uh, been amongst the second set. Now, because of all this change, change, I don't even know where our certificate is. We have done, we have done training, we have done the thing it's in, in a loop. Is it difficult to get the agencies of government to work to favor? I just we just finished Lagos International Trade Fair and I was there. And a man from Sun came to my stand, picked one product, made a comment. Yeah, why does this one not have address? Why, 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 why? Meanwhile, somebody just asked me and I just put a label of that name on it. I said, are you not seeing the ones with addresses and the uh, <laughs> numbers? Then he now snapped that one. I went to his stand and I followed him. And I got to their stand and I said, the lady that I was there, I don't know, maybe that lady came from Abuja. And I said, this your man is arrogant. This is not the way to talk to people. You don't talk to businesses like that. And then this lady wanted to talk and she said, you know, you're not even supposed to sell anything without SOA. And I got angry. And I said, I came to, I went to your office 18 months ago by myself and picked up your form. That form, you said I cannot fill it until you people visit me. Before I even collected that form, it was another story on it. So I was going from Ikoyi to Victoria Island. I finally collected, and then they all kept saying, I will help you, I will help you. At the time, I got angry and I said, I don't need the help. All I want is I want to register for Manka. So don't help me. I'm in a government agency to get service. I don't need help. So they now left me. I said, that form is still in my house, un uncompleted. And she said, eh, because you can be completing it and you make a mistake. And I'm like, wow, these people think we're all dumps. So that form is there. And then you keep going, and then you are harassing people. And I said, is this how government agencies should work? Now that wants to come to your place after collecting 90000 for one product from an MSA, uh, for a micro, and they say, I have grown because I want to do seven. I have grown to become small. You collected 90000 Your people are coming to my factory. They are telling me to pay for their transportation to send vehicles. And I told that guy, I said, where do you, my car is not working. I don't have a vehicle. 
So when we started arguing, somebody now just calmed me down and said, how much is Uber from what you did to Baghdad I just paid? And I paid. Is that mm -hmm. how we should be treated in this country? Mm -hmm. We pay. So many things are happening. That is not that. Please, if government is serious, we need to look down. Mm -hmm. At least if we must get NAVDAC, let NAVDAC people be human beings, True. not uh, the way they are. Let some Absolutely. people be human beings. Mm -hmm. but lastly, why can't we also help Nigerian exporters? Like the um, fidelity she talked about. I sent my goods, but the goods never got there till the thing finished. <laughs> and it's like also, how many people went for the fair? So it's neither here nor there. Meanwhile, the answer to all this money we're looking for every day is so easy. People have said severally, is it what uh, Patrick will do every month or every two months and other people? What does it take? That's why when I said that, I said, the thing that costs, Thank no, you so much. No, because. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You, you again um, touch on some of the complications Iketuku made in his presentation about logistics, about infrastructure, yeah. about incoherent <laughs> But I pass the floor back to uh, our guest speakers. Uh, I don't know who wants to come first, Madam Brahim or Mr. Kalu. Um, I can say uh, something, um, you know, like Mr. Can you hear me? Yes, we, you, we hear you. Yes. Okay. So, um, like Mr. Femi said, I'm on the ground. So, literally, I'm literally, you know, um, on the ground. So, for me, um, in responding to the last speaker, she's spot on. You can feel everybody is passionate every time we talk about this, the challenges and the situation. It all starts from home. It all starts from the grassroots. If we don't get it right locally, then it's hard for us to get it across, you know, the pond. So, uh, but what Mr. Femi said is try and stick to what can we do to get us from 4.8 to uh, 25 billion. Um, one of the things that, you know, I think he made mention of, but literally is our agencies like NEPC, NIPC, and probably a few others engage the local chambers of commerce in those um, countries where we want to do business with or where basically the largest marketplace on the globe. We can even start with America. I was told there was a trade house that was set up or was supposed to be set up in America. Till today, I don't even know where it is. There are trade houses that have been set up in Togo, I think Egypt, um, I think they said China. Um, I know there's one in Kenya. We've sent our goods to uh, uh, the Edo cluster, have sent our products to Kenya. And I believe the goal of these trade houses is to showcase our products you know, and then get, you know, local companies to come in and buy them. The question is, how functional are they right now? We sent our products from the Edo cluster three months ago to go to the trade house in Togo. And we've been monitoring it only to be told just recently that the goods are still in Lagos and we need to now pay extra to take it to the trade house in Togo. And the question is, what is going on here, right? So, but if our you know, chambers of commerce, not just the chambers of commerce, but also the agencies, directors of these agencies and the last administration on the NEPC did a phenomenal job in doing a lot of things with the NEPC as relates to global trade, is to be able to engage with them locally. When you engage with them locally, a number of things happen. One, they start to know who you are. It's important they get to know who you are. Secondly, you start putting it in their face about the kind of products we have the great quality products we have and building those relationships, take advantage of Agoa. And then instead of doing trade shows from say US to Nigeria, fund trade, not just trade shows, sorry, but fund trade missions so that our exporters from Nigeria get an opportunity to visit these countries and see for, the, for themselves what these shelves even look like, what the buyers even look like, and then have meetings with potential buyers including the customs and border patrol, because then they get to hear it, you know, directly from the decision makers as to what it would do for them to successfully export. In the number of trade shows that has happened recently when Nigerians came, you know what I did? With the ones that came to Florida, for example, I took them to a store like uh, the dollar store. And because they do maybe snacks or whatever, I helped them look at the shelves and say, these are the kind of shelves that your products are gonna end up in. You know why? If you're doing plantain chips, there's a certain price that after that price, you ain't going to sell. And now because of the economy, the inflation and all that's going on and the price of goods, a lot of people, me included, 
shop in the dollar store now, you'll be surprised what you find in the dollar store. Normally it's cleaning supplies, but now bread, everything is there and they're competing with Walmart. Walmart is able, constantly sends buyers to go and see so they can kind of match those prices. There's nothing called a dollar store anymore, you know, um, in writing. It's a dollar store name, but it's now 125, right? And so you have to say, look, can I price my products? Because I introduced one to a buyer and she was pricing her cashew nuts at $5. The woman said, I cannot buy it at $5. Look at the ones that are on my shelf, how much I'm selling. And she said, ma, this is how much I sell in Nigeria. This is not Nigeria. There's a price point after which you cannot sell. That's just the bottom line. And I tell people, if you cannot go there, use Amazon. If your prices do not fit with the highest review product on Amazon, then you need to go and revisit that. That's one. The second thing is, you know, uh, uh, buyer-seller matchmaking, being able to match buyers with sellers. This is where people like me come in because we have to be on ground to be able to build those relationships to be able to do that. Thirdly, the government needs to set up packaging centers. A lot of our products are being returned because of how our goods are packaged. We're not, in, we're not complying with the rules of how we package products and a lot of them are, are returned. Then you talk about the content, whether it's the fertilizer used or not used or the beans or the yam and all that. If Ghana has got it right, we could learn a thing or two you know, from the Ghanaians. And then to what the lady said, if they're banning some things to be um, uh, exported, then the government needs to create industrialization centers and policies to be able to help the average SME be able to go through the value chain so they can as well now export these products as a you know process you know uh, product as opposed to uh, a commodity, right? Because for example, in Edo State now we have the Bini River port that is being built, so that we can then move products straight to the sea in Lagos and then maybe even um, maybe through Calabar wherever, so that we can export. Because Benin is a segue to all these other states, and then also we're building a in a industry um, a Benin um, industrial park. If we have these kinds of things with export houses, you know, strategically located and even packaging centers where people can bring their products just before export to say, does this pass? It's like a NAPDAC, you know, does this pass? And if it does, then at least we have helped solve a problem because now we understand what is required in the foreign uh, um, area so that we can meet those requirements and then be able to pass the, uh, the limb test. Thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. We'll still come to you for the closing thoughts in a bit. Um, Mr. Aikichuku, I don't know if you have any reflections or we could move for, to uh, the two other hands that are up. Uh, Mr. Aikichuku, if you have any reflections, we welcome them now. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna um, pick my intervention from so the answering as regards to the last um, question that was asked as to how government can intervene. Um, in my presentation, I spoke about um, how we can cluster and bring proper advocacy. I see that in the narration that she did, where the NAFTA person had to, where they had to relate with the regulator. There was no reference to any cluster head or anything. There was no reference to any previous relationship, any established relationship. So th there's still that that regulator regulated relationship is still not there. And so for clusters or for people who are in that category, we must have associations where people must have gone through um, the inspection who have gone through. So you know what to expect um, when they come not. Um, demands that are arbitrary. So you understand that facilitate that sort of um, relationship with uh, NAFTAC itself. And then you also facilitate relationship with other their agencies like PEPEC, where if um, regulators are giving it tough time, you can make complaints and they can look at it and and really, really look into your case and, uh, and um, try to mediate uh, between you guys. But then, if it is on a case-by-case -case basis, it becomes a problem. And so what I would advise in that sense is, let's get ourselves together, get yourself together, um, engage, with, engage with these bodies. Um, the NDPC is there, the PEPEC is there, they are all there to hear um, most of us. And the NDPC is responsible for export. Um, for people like Afi, I expect that, of course, there'll be a ranking sort of um, system where top exporters or people who are involved. So you have a database such that they know who to contact 
when they want to go on those missions. I expect that NFPC should have such institutional frameworks. And if it's missing, these are the sort of things that should come up when you interact with them, um, when they have meetings and you interact with some of these um, regulators. And so that that's that that would be my intervention in that case. So that plus two. Um, the logistics as well, in terms of also other relationships, I see Afi mentioned the, some of the things that the state governments are doing. State governments are also very important in this conversation. I mean, they could do a lot more um, because they are with the local people, so they understand the challenges better and that they can intervene. And so one of the things that could happen is to make much more demands from state governments because they are closer um, and they can maybe Ministry of Commerce, maybe Ministry of Investment, whichever one that's responsible within your sphere of operation, I think that they can be able to inter intervene in such matters. Um, to the question of um, FS forwards, mostly, most of the SS forwards um, that you see in that $6 billion have been FS forwards that were um, banking, private sector related. Um, they paid money, um, and they were expecting to be able to get um, credited so that um, they could fund their at a certain date. And that didn't come. And so that's supposed to come up um, later on. But we see that um, CBN sort of missed um, deadline and, and didn't pay some people. And that created some tension in the market. And you saw the hair wire that you have. And so, the, so um, basically, it's from the private sector. Uh, people who gave CBN money ahead of time and CBN promised, they gave CBN Naira and CBN promised to give them dollars at a certain date in future. You know, so that's it. Um, I think one more question from um, uh, Molufemi. Okay. Uh, but he was making reference to the fact that um, what could be done in terms of the $25 billion as to what I think that could be done in terms of uh, how governments could respond, why targets should be set. Um, one of the things that I know for, for certain is that we talked about logistics operations. Um, the government has said, this new government has said that they were setting up an export corridor um, for the APAPA ports. Um, for the APAPA ports, we have a terminal has been dedicated to um, exports only. And I expect that people who are into sports would get government on that to ensure that those um, that for, that efficiency that is required for export um, products is is maintained in that place. So everything you have, there's a body, advocacy body in in the ports in terms of bribery, and I see the way they do their reports. They Sally she put their uh, advocacy in the media to say. This is where we have the highest bribe demand. This is where we have, I expect that sort of things, where you have the bottlenecks. I expect within that terminal, exporters are giving information to say, this is where we have issues. This is where there's delay. This is where we experience bottlenecks. This is where, put the information out there. Let it not be hidden. Let put the information out there so that people can engage with these things. People can understand. Even policymakers can see the embarrassment that, yes, these guys are, they want to really do this, and then they are being, um, they are making the loudest noise as to what is important for their industry. So there has to be that conversation. There has to start that I'll, conversation. I'll jump in there. I'll jump in there and steer the conversation towards uh, Mr. Ali Inda Abu. I think he's the South Africa uh, trade at attaché. I know Izan has been up for a while, uh, and he's been in and out. So Mr. Uh, Ali Inda Abu, please, I'll give you the floor. Then uh, Mr. Mohamed Ak. And we get the last closing comment from uh, Mr. Femi Boyede. I you... know you want me to. I know you want me to come in to make closing comments, but I just wanted to encourage my dear brother uh, Ike. Um, there's this uh, saying that happy are those who expect little, for they will never be disappointed. I'm sorry to say that your expectations are just too, 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 too high level, too high up there, and may not be met in the way that you want them to be met. Every single thing that you have said, my dear brother, Patrick is just one of those voices 
that have been uh, uh, trying to amplify. Mm. In fact, if you ask me, I don't know why I still have a voice because my larynx should have disintegrated many years ago. I started this campaign 30 years ago, but it's not about me, me, me. It's just to give you an insight into what some of us, including John Isemede, I don't know if he had another uh, engagement, it, it, I mean, have now. been on for over 30 years, we have been championing this. So I'm aware of Wale Adeni, the Controller General of Customs, uh, interest and passion, and the reason why he designated Lily Pond as an export terminal. But I can tell you for a fact and for free that I was on an NTA program, Lens on Africa, about two Fridays ago with the controller of the uh, Lily Pond Export Terminal of the Nigerian Customs Service. I think this is scratching the surface. I think that people like Wale Adeni, uh, Dera Ansem, and uh, the gentleman controller who was on that program with me, actually need also to put together uh, uh, probably a bigger think tank of people like you, Afi, and um, some of the other eggheads out here on this call today. And then I'm using that, as, as they say in uh, when they do Christian crusades, as a point of contact, because we seem to be preaching to the converted. When you bring government agents to this conversation, so NEPC had a national conference on non-oil exports at the Transcorp Hilton Hotel about one and a half, two months ago. And I can tell you that immediately after the closing ceremony, immediately after, even the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment had gone because for them, the success is in the opening ceremony. But these are the people who are supposed to sit down and listen to what you and I and other players, stakeholders, and uh, 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 practitioners are saying. They never do. And this has been a recurrent perennial challenge. The authorities never sit down to listen, to hear, so that they can map out an action plan. And for that reason, we at Catholic have decided that everything, that's why we record what we're saying, we push it down their throat and hope that one day, I told Afi this morning, let's not uh, uh, relent in what we are doing. Someday, it will get to the ear of somebody who will feel our concern, who will feel our pain and do something about moving this sector forward. My very right. first interview with uh, uh, on Morning Line with Nancy at the uh, onset of this administration, I articulated and amplified the fact that I have seen all the economic uh, initiatives that the Bola Ahmed Tinubu administration has put on the plate. Until today, I am yet to see a single one that is devoted to non-oil exports and the critical role that it's got to play in Nigeria's economy until the government itself, because we are a government-led economy, because even a country as advanced as Canada, as advanced as Australia, as advanced as the United States of America, they have deliberate policies, deliberate strategies, deliberate support tools, instruments, and incentives to support their trading outside their shores. Until we get to this level, Nigeria is a non-starter. I'll jump Sorry, in. Sorry, I'll, I'll I jump needed in to there. bring yes. that up. And we need you to save your larynx so that when we get there, we can sing, you know, <laughs> hallelujah together. Uh, let's get let's get this last set of comments. I'm very aware of the time. We're short past the time. And if you leave it left to me, I think if we go on for the next 30 to 40 minutes, we can still have very meaningful conversation. But I'm going to welcome Mr. Um, Ali Nda, please. I knew you were going to speak before Mr. Boyde took the mic. Please, I will, I will welcome you now, please. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Faye, for, for the opportunity. 
And I think for me, this is always one of my learning platforms uh, where I pick a lot of uh, knowledge from. For me, boy, the long, long before now, I said in one of the conferences that let's pray. When he said, let's pray, everybody closed their eyes and said, may the oil well of Nigeria dry. And that is that is how the journey began uh, for, 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 for me, boy, in terms of oil export. Uh, and I think I'm so passionate and I'm so proud of what he's doing so far. But I think, uh, you see, basically, I, I, I rose my hand, but I brought it down because I, I realized that many things I wanted to say what was already said. The, is that, for example, let me give one critical example. Now, for me, we did talk about uh, government participation in this kind of conferences. I mean, this kind of webinar. There are no government uh, representation. I am a government official, but I'm I'm ten I'm uh, I'm attending this uh, event just for me to have knowledge. But you see, there's always a big issue between the regulatory agencies, NAVDAC, and uh, what do you call the other guys, Son. So I think I think there has to be that deliberate uh, handshake between those agencies if they really want to move the non uh, non uh, sport forward, and that's one thing I think we should also look at. And then secondly, I think again the, the focus should also go in line with what uh, the first presenter Kate talked about. Is the funding of MSMEs? They will say you are funding MSMEs for export led growth. It's not what we're doing in Nigeria. I know I've been in South Africa for like a year plus now. And within this period of this my stay, I see what government does for MSMEs to export their product outside the shore of South Africa. And I think we begin to think uh, more into that line. And thirdly, uh, I had a, a conversation with uh, NEPC uh, ED recently, and I was saying to her, look, our focus is coming too wide. Why not focus on specific products? Let's just pick analysis of one, two, three, four, five products. And say, okay, we'll focus on these products we we'll take it from the beginning. I mean, is it from farm, you say in English, to the to the chefs. Let's develop that strategy. And then again, begin to give our export promotion agencies target to meet, target to achieve, and target to move Nigeria forward in terms of the non uh, non export. I thank you for the opportunity. And my honorary commissioner, it's nice seeing you for the first time after we've spoken many, many times on phone. <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> yes. Thank you. Thanks for keeping it brief and punchy. Um, Johnny Simeri, I'm coming to you now uh, okay. for your comment, and then we, we go back to, uh, I know Elizabeth had her hand up, but down now, if she wants to comment, she comes after uh, Dr. Johnny Simeri, and then Mohamed A.K., I also see your hand up, we'll take you after Johnny Simeri, and then we take the closing uh, comments from our esteemed and very brilliant speakers. Uh, Mr. John, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely happy to be here this evening, seeing my commissioner the first time, and I have a lot of questions for her. Not question per se, but the idea of collaboration and support from behind. Carlo, you have done a very good job. Boy, they will tell you that some of us have over 40 years experience, and we have traveled around the continent of Africa by road. When you were making your presentation, you did not give the, um, the comparison between the United States, China, Malaysia, and other, because those ones are producing. We are not producing anything. The only thing we do is that we borrow. Because I don't want to go into all that. Look at our foreign reserve, you are talking of 33.56 for a population of 200 million, which shows that Nigeria is a very poor country. We can't compare ourselves with Iraq, with Iran, with Libya, with Gabon when you talk of per capita income. Another thing we have to look at is that JP Morgan gave us the true picture that whatever they are telling the little children here today, some of us have access to this outside. I don't want to comment on our MDAs. They are policemen. They don't support. They are only in revenue angle tell you do A, B, C, D, and when your products are rejected, we don't see them. The certificate they give to us, they, they don't cross the border or the port. Because for me, to go beyond Unibel, go to Unila, go to UK and America, is because of NUC, and that certificate is approved. The issue of produce export, we did not suffer this fate before 1953, 1963. What eventually happened? There was a conspiracy between the West and some of our middlemen. 
Three years ago, there was an event in Abuja. And when I was making comment, comparing Nigeria with Kenya, with Ghana and all that, that you cannot go to the farm in Ora, in, in Benin City, and all other areas, in countries like Kenya and all that, you will not be allowed in. There's a structure in place. Where is that structure? Even when products not produced by Nigeria are rejected, so people will say the exporters did not. I have advised exporters, if you have a certificate of origin and you have other documents, go and take such a person to court. I will provide a lawyer for you. The other issue we have to look at, this one now is just a collaboration or a support to my sister. Funny enough, we, are from, we were from the same local government before Owa East and Owa West. I know the family very well. And I have sent a lot of things to her when she was with our governor. You are welcome. The first thing I want to say, cashew nut is available in Edo State. At what price? Yes. This same cashew nut, if it's taken from Edo to India or Thailand, no, not <clears throat> Vietnam, is 4,000 US dollar to the to America. When we re-export, it becomes 6,000 US dollar per ton. <laughs> who is gaining? Because the middlemen are those who are what of cocoa? Boye has given you the example. In Ghana, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Cameroon, we have seen all these things. Yam, we are not bad. As I'm talking to you, four or five trailer loads of yam are loaded in my village every day. What are the farmers getting? Even with the anchor borrowers program was more or less in five-star hotel. My people did not get cobble out of it. Then, which foreign market, even those of us in Edo, I'm not talking about Nigeria, if we have not developed, Edo has no capacity to build market because we have a lot of our children in Italy, in England, in America, and all that. Those who want to serve what the Indians and the Chinese are doing here when you cut a diaspora program. You know, the diaspora we have in Abuja for a five-star hotel. Another good example is that look at Malaysia. Malaysia is not as big as from Lagos to uh, Agbo. Last year, they made 35 billion for the sale of farm produce. That seedling was taken from Malaysia. Sorry, it was taken from 1964. Yes. I traded that seedling to Malaysia in 2011 when I was doing my PhD. And at the end of the day, we are borrowing instead of us to be producing and working as a family. My sister, where do we have the institution for capacity building? We have the best police in the world. We have pilots. We have engineers. We have doctors. Where are those who are training the managers of tomorrow? When I'm talking here, when Boede is talking here, you think that Jesus Christ is coming tomorrow. Even if Jesus comes, which exporter is coming to meet? So these are things. You gave the example of Agua. We failed in Agua woefully. I was in Ghana, part of those who started the project in 2000. And by 2002, before 2012, Ghana has created over 200 direct jobs right from Agua. Nigeria is still zero. Even Obama bent backward to help our people. We still recorded zero. So the final line, madam, what of logistics? Those who are talking of export, you don't do uh, export by trailer. How much to carry a bag of cocoa from Ihebe to Lagos? If you look at solid minerals, from your village down to the end of the state, it's a home of solid minerals. Yes. Nigeria is not even got 0.03%. South Africa is getting 30%. There's a new trust. The new administration said they are going to increase it to 52%. We are working on it. The only professor of ceramics in Nigeria is a very good cool friend of Boy is from Ekoma. We can do a lot in solid minerals. And those states should not be left behind for us to be moving around the world begging. We have cocoa, we have rubber, we have manpower, about six, seven universities, we have a port, we have cocoa and all that. There's no reason why it should not be among the best, like what Western region was doing the town of Chief Abu Abbefemi and Wolowo. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Simede. Uh, Adamu Gambo, we take you. I don't think um, Madam Nwa still wants to speak. If you want to just raise your hand, so we take you after Adamu Gambo, and then we call it a wrap. I think A.K. Mohammed was there, some with his hand up. Uh, not anymore. Okay. Go ahead, please. Mr. Adamo, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, please, I would like to register my appreciation to our president, Aboide, for organizing this uh, monthly uh, program. 
In fact, we really appreciate you and thank you for the opportunity of this uh, program. Uh, I listened to uh, carefully from the beginning up to this moment. Yes, I can understand our emotions. And then the way and manner in which we ventilate our frustrations and disappointment with the systems and the processes, procedures on how things are going on in our countries. Uh, but I would also like to appreciate the steps so far taken by my sister, Afi Shetu, while she was the commissioner of uh, uh, trade in Edo State. You know, you were introduced to us in this uh, token trade by Mr. our president, Mr. Boyde. Right from that time, I read all your input contribution in our platforms. We really appreciate that. I'm so much happy that you have put that into practice. Now, I believe, uh, Mr. President, what is the way forward? We can't continue to be ventilating emotions and frustrations in each and every of our gatherings. We must set the way. How do we address all these issues? How do you go around some of these obstacles? Some of these obstacles are created by people that we are together with. Most especially this government agent that we are paid to drive uh, export business in this country. But at the same time, at the point in time, they will tell you their hands is tight and they cannot shout. Then where do we shout? Where do we begin? Where do we start? To me, uh, businesses like this doesn't uh, require 100% leaning on government. Rather, it must be a private uh, sector driving thing. Now, how do we do that? If you have a lack of minds, like my sister as commissioner in the state. And each state should take this as a kind of competition between them. I can see Edo is marketing itself, packaging itself in the global space. Then what am I doing in Kano? With all the available resources that we have. I started this meeting while I was uh, in the Abyssal Processing Plant in Kano, here in Kano. I see the enormous opportunities that we have. Shut up. Shut up. You believe with me. Uh, like Mexico, when they suspended uh, buying uh, a business from Nigeria, they give us some conditions in which we met. Now, our product must be fornicated, all these sort of things, and that. Out of the nine fornication chambers that we have in this country, we have so many income. What are we doing with this? What advantage are we taking out of it? We have to sense it. So I mean, when I went to our uh, international market, that is the Dawano market, you yeah. need to see the truck lot of soybeans in that market. Must we still wait for government to give us this standard? Knowing very well that we have FX talents in this country. And our mono export commodity cannot take us anywhere. That is the oil. We must have uh, diversified um, our economy. Now, if the government are serious, and we are also serious, Hello. The door has been open for us. So I would like to advise um, uh, Mr. President, maybe next time we need, what is the way forward? How do we address all these issues? Where do we start? Yes, I know. You have been on this for more than 30 years. You have seen the turbulences and what have you in this uh, struggle. But at the same time, we need to evaluate ourselves. Just like uh, what my brother Kalu said, I look at the figures. If you look at those figures, actually, you must feel somehow. Is it, are we in a country? What of this uh, solid, uh, these resources that go to endure on us? Now, one other thing that uh, maybe we are not looking at that angle. Um, the way and manner in which these foreigners come into our land, I can say that taking over our businesses, mm. but taking over our businesses is not an issue, but breaking our laws is one of the most serious issues that we must look into. For instance, I just cited an example of the one. You need to see the number of Indians, the Chinese that are there. Some, I don't know whether they have uh, full immigration papers to be in our country. Mm. And then their access to our farm gate is an issue. In fact, to me, it's a security threat. So unless and until we are able to dissect and look down into our issues. 
with the mindset of addressing the challenges rather than ventilating our emotion, frustrations, and allowing ourselves to be overwhelmed by these problems. Obviously, obviously, uh, we need to get over this. I'm mm -hmm. not. That, that, that's a good place. I to cannot pass. allow myself to be overwhelmed okay. by any issue. Mm. I have so many. We, we are all believers. If you look at uh, David and Golia, no matter, look at the size of David. Uh, sorry, mm. Golia. But that didn't detect David from confronting him. Indeed. Oh, this, indeed. This, this story indeed. happens in all the two books. For, for the sake of time, uh, Mr. Gambo, I will pass the no, mic very quickly. And then at the same time, sorry, sir. Yes. Please. Now, when you have an obstacle, when you have a course to write, um, Mr. President, I want us to take the course of Moses. When he was pursued by Pora, when he started moving, then God asked him, what do you have in your heart? He said he has a stick. Oh, to use it. He doesn't know that when he used us, he didn't that river divide for him to cross over? This thing is in our two books. Then what are we doing? For every obstacle, let's go back. How do we go over it? Obviously, God was giving us a way to address it. Thank you so much, Thank Mr. You. President. If, if you will, Thank please, you. let me pass the mic to for the last comment from Mr. Mohamed A.K. I know we're short of time, and then we close with uh, Madam Afishetu and uh, Mr. A.K. Chuku. Mohamed A.K., please. Thank you for, for taking the floor now. I wonder if his network is being on fear right now. Maybe I pass the mic to you, uh, our guest speakers, Mr. Ikechibu Kalu, Madam Afishe, to Brian Mo. Who wants to go first, please? Mr. I uh, Kalu, please, you can take the floor. Okay, um, thank you very much um, for the opportunity once again um, to be able to uh, present to this group. Um, I've listened very carefully to all of the contributions um, and the experiences that are behind it. I commend um, the efforts that have been put into it diligently. However, drawing from um, the, converse, the intervention of uh, Mr. Damu um, this is not the time to give up. Uh, this is the time to re-engage. Uh, probably train strategy. Um, like we said, the export led growth has to be private sector. We know the challenges in terms of how government responds. But the truth about it is also that when you succeed, government will come around. And so the need is that we have to um, maintain that pole position. And for I, I would also say that um, we have to engage the political economy rather than just relating with uh, the agencies. I know the foster relationship with agencies, but then we have to explore um, using political economy. I'm sure that uh, the commissioner would understand uh, what, what I'm talking about in terms of um, exploring contacts and relationships that we'll be able to. I mentioned Pebec, um, which is the presidential ease of business, doing business. Um, these are agencies that sort of help to try to untie bottlenecks. I'm sure also in states, I know that you have investment promotion agencies that try to also untie some of these naughty issues. I mean, the way they operate, they are poised to operate differently from the usual civil service and all of all that. So there are issues that we can always explore, work around from that. I think that it's some way that the export group will also find a way to engage properly and then push the issues that are relevant to them. Um, I, I believe that all of our dreams, all of our hopes will materialize um, going forward. Thank you very much for that opportunity. We're grateful indeed for the insights you've shared with us today. We cannot thank you enough. Uh, Madam Afi Shetu Braimo, the floor is yours now, please, for your closing remarks. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much. Um, I, once again, I want to say thank you um, for inviting me um, to be on this amazing uh, discussion. Um, to uh, Mr. John um, Isimede, good evening, sir. And, and I do remember you now, but um, what I want to say, though, in terms of everything that you said, mm -hmm. that John Isimede, is you're absolutely right. <clears throat> you're spot on on a lot of those issues and challenges which is not 
um, explicit to Edo State, but all of Nigeria. And so at that level, unfortunately, it's a lot of government intervention. However, given that I came from the private sector to the public sector, I did what I could as an individual and carrying people along, building communities, building clusters, building cooperatives so that when the demand comes, we can respond to it. So we need thousands of athletes, thousands of Kalus. Um, and I like what he said about, you know, as Kyle said about, if, I, was say, I think if every commissioner in every state had the political will to tackle the issues that are faced by the SME, SMEs, including the startup bill, including the ease of doing business, you know, I think that we would move that needle just a little bit at a time. So the 30 years and the 40 years that's Mr. Uh, Femi and Mr. John have spent trying to tackle this problem, they start to see some sort of green lights, but I will not relent. For me, I think it's my life's work now to move this forward. I'm passionate about Nigeria. I'm passionate about Made in Nigeria products. And until someone says stop, we will get our products there in the global marketplace. But one step at a time, I think even tied to, you just mentioned something about cashew. As a result of that, I made a promise to the Edo youth that I would, you know, provide, you know, make them employers of labor because forget the jobs, we're blessed with the natural resources. So I've started a beekeeping empowerment program and it's just started so they can earn and then, you know, be able to grow their communities. And it starts with the communities as well. It starts with the grassroots. Our local government should be empowered to do a lot of things that the government is doing at the federal level. A lot of this is run by local governments in other countries, especially um, America and Canada. You know, um, a lot of the trade shows, a lot of the, you know, chambers of commerce decisions, a lot of it is the local government. What are they doing? But they can't do anything if the governor or the government does not impact that, you know, power on them. You know, so a lot of that, there's a lot that the government has to play, but I'm an exporter. I've been for a long time. There are many that are exporting. And as we continue to have these conversations and the word is engagement, collaboration, engagement. You know, if we can engage a lot further with the government, the, using our networks and I'll continue to do that, I think we'll be able to move forward. On that note, I want to say thank you so, so, so much for inviting me. This is a pleasure and I'll do whatever I can to always be a part of these discussions. And let's stop all these, you know, meetings of not all export meetings and all that. Let's let's get actionable steps and let's start to check them off one step at a time. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed, madam. Uh... And talking about actionable steps, um, following this event, we will, we will have we will have we the will. action point from this meeting, and we hope we can share with you also, uh, as well as with every other member or every other participant today. And this is where I pass uh, the last word to Mr. Olufemi Boyede, the convener and the brain behind uh, talking trade. Mr. Boyede, please don't bust those larynx, okay? <laughs> Much, and um, you've uh, uh, done a wonderful standing in or sitting in for Lady K. Our hearts and uh, prayers are with her for a, a speedy recovery. And um, I want to, as usual, appreciate, acknowledge, and applaud you guys. Uh, Mr. Ibrahim Haruna, Dr. Oluato Itaibo. <laughs> Uh, Kemi Amusha, aka Lady K, Tommy, Adebote, Sheyi, Adebote, and um, all together known as the world's best team. I appreciate you guys so much. Alaji Gambo, um, please rest assured that we are not withdrawing. We are on a march of no retreat, no surrender until Nigeria becomes an export-driven economy. And like Shei said, we will have actionable steps. Please, um, if we actually, uh, uh, if we come uh, looking for you to join that uh, train, uh, we hope that um, you will open the door and you will join uh, what it is that uh, we plan to do. I have asked um, Shei to um, engage with uh, one or two uh, other persons who have been on this call today. Um, our Your Excellency uh, Abunda Ali, I think the time has come for us to also be saddling you with uh, some responsibilities. Afi mentioned 
if every commissioner could do, uh, I mean, could chart a course, could create a focus uh, in the line of non-oil exports. But I am aware that your ministry, Industry, Trade and Investment, does have an annual National Council on Industry, Trade and Investment. I am not too sure of how many times or how many people, practitioners, um, knowledgeable experts that are invited to these, your councils of industry, trade and investment. So the first responsibility that on behalf of the team and the, the members of uh, TATRI that I am uh, charging you with is to bring this to the attention of your ministry, your minister, uh, to probably include going forward a feedback mechanism that allows experience sharing from people who are actually in the field. I know that before the national councils, you do have, I think the last one you held in Katsina, I know about three or four people who were there night and day preparing papers. No, it is not time for preparing papers. These papers come from other textbooks. Let's hear people who are there in the field who are feeling the pinch of absent or in, uh, inefficient infrastructure, who are feeling the impact of over-dramatization of the domestic trade environment. For example, and I will close on that, if not, I will keep on and on and on. When you hear devaluation or the, uh, uh, what do you call it, Naira is now 1,350. Then the government says, oh, this is good for export. Has anybody asked how this is good for export? How can it be good for export? I bring Gary into Toronto. As of today, if I'm to distribute to the 250 or so Nigerian stores there, they will not buy my Gary more than the 74 cents per kg that they bought it in 2019. Oh, in 2019, and uh, Elizabeth Nwako is aware of this because I packaged in her uh, factory there in Ibadan. In 2019, a kilogram of gari cost, it cost me 173 naira per kg. And by the time I add the cost of packaging, and the cost of transportation, I arrive <clears throat> at the, uh, the African store. I propose my gari at 95 cents. They say, no, they're not taking. Mm -hmm. They give me 74 cents. So if I have a, a, a profit margin of maybe 0.5%, today, the same kilogram of gari has gone up to 800, 900 naira. And I'm still going to do packaging. I'm still going to pay, uh, uh, what do you call it, freight charges that are now factored at the current exchange rate of 890 something naira per dollar, official rate. But by the time it gets to uh, uh, Toronto, it's already maybe one dollar uh, uh, 80 something cents. The person I'm going to uh, sell to has not marked up how much they're going to buy it from me. How does this become an advantage for non-oil exports unless government activates the 18 uh, uh, incentives that exist under the uh, uh, Export Incentives and Miscellaneous Act of 1986? out of which only the export expansion grant is functional today. And that I have told you guys, since 2017, no Nigerian exporter has been able to receive their grants. Somebody needs to hear this. And I can tell Mr. Gambwaruna and everybody here that we always make sure that the conclusions of these, our meetings, it's not just a talk show. We send them to the uh, appropriate authorities and the recording of this one in the next uh, 24 hours i am sending them to the personal uh, box of uh, uh, noye ayeni the ed of nepc as well as the minister of industry trade and investment let's hope that 
uh, let me end with a Gambo's <laughs> analogy. Let's Jesus. hope that there is a butler out there who will draw attention of Pharaoh to the existence of solutions to these problems that seem to defy their understanding with absolute due respect. I end of this, on this note and I say thank you, thank you, and thank you very much indeed because we are coming back again the next month for the next edition. Thanks. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. It's unfortunate that I, I am late because I'm in Turkey at the moment uh, the, on the same issue we are discussing on this platform. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to say, even though I have not had the entirety of the conversation, is that we are making concerted effort. Not only should we export the raw materials we are exporting now from Nigeria, but we are trying to pull our industries from Turkey particularly to come and set up in Nigeria and at least give us the, the core primary processes but unfortunately, the terms and condition of setting up industries in Nigeria is really, 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 really uh, hard to, to actually attract any investor or any manufacturer to come into Nigeria. I have had, in fact, I, I finished a meeting just about an hour ago and I rushed back to my hotel to join this very conversation. And the complaint is, the terrain of certain of industry in Nigeria is not conducive. That is, I have I have discussed right from the time we went for the Turkey Africa Forum uh, last month to today. That is the complaint. We have had meetings, myself and my partner, Mr. Saidu Barista Saidu, who is not in this forum, unfortunately, will have testified this. And we are coming in to experiment on something in Nigeria, the Durham wheat. I have the sample. I'm coming to Nigeria next week with it. We are doing uh, irrigation to see if that will set up, it will assist us in importation of Durham wheat by many of the flower manufacturing company like Honeywell, uh, a golden penny flower, etc. So, but honestly and honestly speaking, we need to put our strength and approach the Federal Ministry of Industry. Hmm. Indeed. Thank, thank you. Right. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, that, we, we'll put this forward for the next, we don't know when the next will be, but we keep this and we hope the next time you'll be able to join us in good time and we can enjoy all of yes, this. Yes, I hope so. Thank I was you. really, it pained me that I'm just coming in, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, Please I enjoy the rest you. of your day, everyone. And let's keep going. Okay, like, if there are two questions I live with, how do we get to 25 billion in 20, um, uh, in 2025? And how, how can we get more Nigerian products out there? Keep thinking about that. And uh, for now, goodbye from all the Satric team. Bye for now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I this wish my you. sister thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I put in the chat uh, the link to our WhatsApp group if you would like to join and be part of this talk in trade and investment uh, global network. I've also put in the chat all the links to our social media platforms. Feel free to follow and uh, be part of this conversation. And as we get updates from all of this, we will gladly share with you. I want to very, um, very much appreciate the team led by Mr. Femi Boyede. I see uh, Dr. Olutaiwa also with our smiles. I see uh, Alaji Ibrahim Haruno and uh, Tomini Adebote, whose network has been in and out for a while now. But we really do appreciate this teamwork and the, what we are able to produce every month. Uh, we were thinking this will be the end for the year. If something else happens, you may see us again. Otherwise, it's been a wonderful year. And I cannot say thank you enough to Madam Adekemi Amushan, Lady K herself, who from January up till now has always been 
leading these conversations. And I know she's in the space. Maybe we don't get to see her face today, but we are very grateful for all the support and the dedication that she's given to this project. Uh, I see many of you are turning on your cameras. It's fine to do that and say bye-bye. And uh, we really want to thank Mr. Ka Kechiku oh. Kalu, Miss uh, Madam Afishetu Brahimo also. We are really grateful indeed. Thank <laughs> you.